We ask, Lord, that you be triumphant within us. Not to do anything except whatever it is that you want us to do. We thank you, Lord, for leading us this far. We thank you, Lord, for our ability to hear and to see and to feel and to think and to begin to understand. We pray because your Spirit is praying within us. Your Spirit is urging us. We pray, therefore, together with Christ, in his name. Amen. Okay, here we go. (laughs) I hope that uh, what we can do tonight is just somehow set a context for, for all that we'd like to do. And uh, it'll unravel, I guess, as time goes on. It seems to me that the, uh, the logical words are the words that we, we chose for our title, Action and Contemplation. A very traditional image of that, um, I think it's been used by any number of people, is the image of the um, spring and the stream. Contemplation, of course, be- being the, the spring. And if we just have that, and of course it won't be true contemplation, but if we just think that reflection or our looking or seeing or attempts at prayer are the whole picture, we have a stagnant pool if we just have the spring. We have to have the, the flowing out that is the stream. And of course if you just have the stream, you won't have a stream for long, action, if there isn't something feeding that stream. I think it's a very simple image, but it's a marvelous basic image for what we're talking about. And uh, we're convinced by the very title we chose that, that we've got to keep those two poles, and they almost are poles, unfortunately, uh, somehow in, in tandem, parallel, moving together. And every spiritual master, it seems, has said that in one way or another, and yet still after 2,000 years of Christianity, it's, it's a very hard balance to achieve. In fact, we look at so much of, of institutional religion, and in many cases it's exactly neither of those. Not really contemplation and not really action, but somewhere in sort of the, the middle ground that's rituals and law and order and structures, and but not really calling people to a radical inner journey are really calling people to a radical outer journey of action in the world. And it seems to me that, that the church has, has, has lost its power because it's lost those two uh, seeming extremes of the in, radical inner journey to the center uh, that we're, we're calling it, and the journey toward action. The, uh, the Greek mind, the uh, Roman organization model, quickly took over the gospel. And in many ways, that's been the bias that the Western church has brought to the gospel since its hearing, not the, uh, the first century, but very quick after, although it begins even in the first century, sort of a bias toward the mind, toward thinking, thinking, and still to this day, dissent, as recently as the recent pap- papal trip, uh, a d- dissent is largely not agreeing on ideas. And, and you cannot act at all or not be involved in action, and there doesn't seem to be any concern in great part about that. It's do you hold the correct ideas? And, and what Western civilization has, I think, trapped the gospel there, trapped it in the head. And, and so we, we want to, to have that bias toward action, that it's somehow in, in stepping forward and putting our life over here instead of over there, that something happens inside of us. Maybe it's, it's the only way we really learn down here and here, in the heart and in the gut. And, and that, of course, ties us back into contemplation, which is not just a, a head kind of perception of God, but a holistic perception of God, a knowing that is beyond left brain knowledge. So the, the, the title we've chosen, very intentional, even though it gives us an awfully long title, I, I think we, we didn't want to risk anybody missing what we were about, and even holding ourselves to what we want to be about. To to teach at the same time and call ourselves and ask of ourselves a contemplative journey. And we'll try a bit uh, tonight to describe what that might be. And in the same moment, almost on parallel track, to call ourselves to action, which I think corrects the contemplation, and the contemplation is a corrective to the action. If I had to give two words, the images being the spring and the stream, if I had to give two words, I'd I'd speak of surrender and responsibility. Surrender and responsibility. And again, 
uh, the healthiest Christians I know, the healthiest believers I know, are always characterized by both of those. But, but you can tell somewhere, somehow, they handed their life over. They're not protecting it. They're not holding on to it. They're not advertising it. They're not, they're not, it's not their thing anymore. You, you see, there's been some kind of ego separation or ego union. And uh, it, it, it's always an authentic Christian. And yet, in, in many ways, it's become a most rare commodity in modern Christianity. We have a very, very sophisticated form of Christianity today which has had the, the effect of confirming the ego, confirming the self, and, and polishing up the self, and, and healing the self, and uh, teaching the self, and, and uh, weighing, analyzing the self, whether it's moral or immoral, good or bad, always affirming or denying reality, analyzing and judging our own reality. And in that, it's made surrender most impossible, it seems. For, so much so that uh, it seems to me a lot of people don't even seem to know that that's the religious question. Uh, a, a lot of institutional religion, to me, seems to be emphasizing self-control. And I'm convinced the issue is self-surrender. And they're almost on, on opposite courses. If you put all, uh, again, I would have to say, a recent papal trip would have given you the impression that Christianity is self-control and largely in regard to sexual issues, right? And if you are self-controlled there, you're a Christian. I, uh, I'm not trying to be anti-papal, but I think that is so puzzled and so limited. Now, maybe that's not what he wanted to say, but that's what came across to our country, a gospel of self-control. Now, I'm sure in his own heart and mind and experience, that has come from an experience of self-surrender. I, I don't doubt that at all in the Holy Father, that, that he understands and has undoubtedly walked a journey of self-surrender. But what, has, uh, what comes with great difficulty to our people, and I mean even we good liberal Vatican II folks, right, if some of us consider ourselves that, uh, is, is, is the language of self-surrender. It's more the language of accumulation, spiritual accumulation, uh, accumulation of ideas, accumulation of theories, opinions, feelings, experiences, perceptions, and uh, it's, it's really spiritual materialism. And it doesn't look like materialism because it's so spiritual, you know. But what, what remains untouched is the ego, is the, that the self is center stage. Uh, at 20 years since Vatican II, we, we've, we've had to face that, that so many things that we thought were the answer. Good up-to-date liturgy. Good, thank God, scripture. Uh, uh, good parish councils. Good collegial structures or whatever they might be. And as you know, I, I hope I'm for all of those, absolutely for all of those. But so many of them have fallen flat and have not really generated life because, um, I don't say there's only one reason, but one reason for that, at least in some of the, the involvements I've been a part of, is uh, simply that each individual person with their opinions and their feelings has never been questioned. In other words, the separate privatized ego is still center stage. It's my thing, my opinions, my ideas my agenda, my role, my uh, uh, need for the parish. And so it, it kind of, all these good, well-educated Vatican II people come in and fight one another with their opinions or with their, their uh, loyalty group, with, with the, the position that they're fighting for. And what we see has happened is the loss of what is most traditional teaching, the understanding that, that what has to come first is death. Now, that's, that's the most primitive, primitive theology of baptism. The Pauline theology of baptism is the whole journey starts by dying. And it used to be literally walking into the water, the imagery of drowning. And until there's been this death, this letting go of the privatized, separate self and entering into a new union, living in a new unitive place where, where you're not protecting your own thing, where you're not advertising doing your own thing, but, but you're a part of a bigger thing, which is not you, which is the Lord's thing. And therefore, failure or success are not the question. Uh, winning or losing are not the question. Being right or being wrong are not the question. The question is being obedient. Faith, patience, and obedience, Merton says, are the guides which must help us advance quietly in darkness without looking at ourselves. Let me repeat that. Faith, patience, and obedience. And those aren't easily 
come to virtue, or the guides which must help us advance quietly in darkness without looking at ourselves. The task we're on pretty much in America, and I'm very psychological, but myself, if those of you who heard my tapes, you know that. But uh, we're in a, a kind of psychologism where everything is looking at the self. Everything is analyzing the self. And, and its motivations, and its purity of intention, and its readiness. And, and what we're seeing is, after all, when the, when the eyes have been put in here so long upon the self, it becomes next to impossible to get those eyes back up and looking back out at some kind of objective reality because you get so enamored with subjectivity. Subjectivity is, is, is tantalizing. It's, it's, it's attractive. It pulls you into it, and it's, it's bottomless. And, and I'm all for it, okay? I hope you're going to hear me keep talking both hands, both hands. But I'm saying it, it's become a whirlpool for our people where once they get in it, they cannot get back out. They can't get back because there's always... Some, some more inner stuff to look at, some more inner stuff to name, some more inner stuff to, to justify, to, to affirm or deny, to agree with or disagree with. And I think that's why I, I like this quote here from Merton, that the, the only people I see who, who move beyond that are, first of all, very simple people who aren't trapped in their heads and over-preoccupied with themselves. Most of us uh, can't go back there, to be honest. I see that as, as the whole garden. We ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, and the cherubs with their flaming swords are at the, the gate and saying, you know, you can't get back into the simple world anymore. It's a shame. The garden is lost to us. I only realize that when I go among the little ones, especially in the third world. I envy their psyche, their consciousness, their, their perception, their questions. Most of us are incapable of that, I'm convinced. We've eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've become analyzing, judging, uh, weighing, and, uh, and the cherubs don't let us back into simplicity. We're, we're eliminated forever from the garden, it seems to me. And that's not all bad, because it makes us wait and long and desire for the, the final paradise, the final garden, the real garden, and, and hopefully long for that simplicity, for that, for that centeredness, for that non-complexity that is precisely contemplation. Um, and I think if faith, patience, and obedience are not common words in, in contemporary Christianity or, or Western Christianity, uh, it's very unfortunate. Because the other great Christians that I've met uh, always have discovered those virtues. Because their center is not in here. The center is somewhere outside of themselves. And so obedience makes sense. And I'm not talking... First of all, obedience to some structure or obedience to me, or, but obedience to the non-self, to an agenda beyond uh, the private agenda, to uh, an obedience to the Word of God, an obedience to the, the Kingdom of God, an obedience to a truth that is beyond my subjective truth. And when we get too enamored with subjective truth, it seems like there's really a loss of love, of objectivity, or, or the reality. And that's where we get back, get back to action to involvement in the world of action. So my, my conviction, and I think we stand on a long line of mystics and saints and prophets, is that the two are the absolutely necessary correctives, one of the other. And those who can surrender, those who can, can entrust themselves to the, the, the love that is at the center, the hope that is, is drawing us out of ourselves, the, the, uh, the life that is beyond our life, it seems, ironically, are the people who can most take responsibility, precisely because they're not doing their own thing anymore. You see, it, fear is going to overtake you otherwise. If it's your agenda, your opinion that you've got to protect, that you've got to promote, that you've got to push, then what, what's constantly going to be inside of you is, what if I'm wrong? What if people don't like me? What if it doesn't work? And that paralyzes us again. But if there's been a surrender, then really, in... in in, in a very true sense, there's no such thing as a mistake anymore. There's no such thing as a mistake. It, it's not your thing you're doing. And so you don't have to keep uh, weighing it. Am I doing it right? or am I, Lord, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to listen to you. And that's all God can ask of us, huh? We try to listen as best we can. We know, Lord, we, we've tried to surrender our hearts. We're, we hope we're not doing our thing. We're doing your thing. And so I'm going to give it my all and let the cards fall where they may. That's the freedom of the saints. 
That's where they can do such courageous, prophetic, radical, risky uh, things because they live in a self-forgetfulness. And if you want to talk about radical language today, you can't get much more radical than talking about self-forgetfulness. Because that just is not our culture. That is not our psyche. That is not our experience. It's not my experience. I wish I could forget this thing a little more. But, but we've, we've learned how to reflect back upon the self. Now, I'd like to uh, take off from that very point. And they tell me this has been growing for uh, certainly the high scholastic period, much of the last thousand years in the West. We have moved into what we call a consciousness, where I am the subject, I am the subject, and I look upon the rest of reality as an object. We objectify reality. So we do that with things, with opinions. We're, we're always out here judging, analyzing, critiquing, which leaves me always apart. I'm over here, and the object is over there. Now, not only do we do that to everything else and everybody, and that's probably why Jesus said, do not judge, but we do it to ourselves. And that's the state of alienation that we hear so much of, that Western people live in, the state of alienation, that they are alienated from their own soul. That I, uh, my an, an analyzing function sits in judgment constantly over my own inner state. Sits in judgment. Am I guilty? Am I not guilty? Am I good, bad, or best? Am I in mortal sin? Am I in venial sin? Am I going to heaven? Or, or, you know, and all it does is trap the person endlessly in their own psyche, in an inner world that, that is, is, is self-perpetuating and self-destructive and, 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 and stupid. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like, I don't know if we even know how to get out of it anymore because it's our constant way of life, the, the self-analysis of our own soul. We can't imagine what it would be to live like without affirming or denying. Without even needing to affirm or deny anymore. Can you imagine living that way for an hour? I mean, <laughs> without affirming or denying anything, without judging anything, just like Mary, just let it be. Just let it be. Now, we religious people are notorious for this, giving value judgments to everything because we're raised and we're given all this moralism, all these value judgments, good, better, best, right, wrong, mortal sin, ba bad, good, you know. And then when you find out is after all this years of, of this kind of training, it doesn't mean that much, you know. It was down in New Orleans a few weeks ago and you meet a prostitute who's a living saint and it just blows the whole thing, you know. I mean, it's a, it doesn't, doesn't mean, and then all these people who go to church Oh, well, we won't make any judgments, but it just, it just it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit what's truly goodness and what's truly evil. Right? Now, the other most radical way of being that, that nobody's going to teach you, if we want to be an alternative, if we really want to be an alternative to this society, even an alternative, unfortunately, to most of the church, the best thing we can call ourselves is to units of experience, which is precisely contemplation. The overcoming of this split. Units of experience. Uh, Descartes probably summarized it most perfectly. You've heard his famous line. Descartes said, Cogito ergo sum. Right? I think, therefore I am. I think makes reality, my reality exists, my thinking ability. And they speak of that as the Cartesian split. Huh? We're all involved in the Cartesian split. Our thinking makes our reality. And um, Merton says it very well in one place. He says, for the, for the contemplative, it's not cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. It's the pure experience of sum, I am. I am. Now, can you imagine, is it in any way possible to move back to that space, to live there anymore? In the, in the naked, naked experience of being. Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure both say almost the exact same thing. That... Being, pure being, just naked existence of anything, anything that is, and goodness are the same thing. Being and goodness are the same thing. They differ only by reason of words. Wow, and that's mind-blowing. <laughs> being and goodness are the same thing. They differ only by reason of words. Now, what a contemplative is, is one who can live at that level of pure being, neither affirming nor denying, neither analyzing or, or weighing even themselves, whether they're holy or whether they're praying. And what that is is a process of, of uh, 
these masks, these personas, these external selves being allowed to fall away. All these identities that we put on ourselves. I am white. I am male. I am American. I am educated. I am articulate. I am all these I am's that we dress ourselves up with. See, now you've got to like me because I'm all of those. Huh? And that, that's what we go around. And, and, and when we die, that's exactly what's going to die. All of those I am that I've been advertising and, you know, holding up for consumption and trying to impress you with. And if that's all I've lived out of for my life on this earth, all these little masks I put on, I've got nothing. I'm empty. To use most traditional language, there's no soul there. There's no center. There's no reality. There's nothing substantive. There's no metaphysical reality to the person. It's simply an endless trying on dresses. The world is like a dressmaker, which just keeps holding a different model in front of us. You know, how about this? Do you want to put that? Yeah, I'll try that. And actually, we have loads of them now, just one dress on after another. Huh? And we think, we think those are ours. This is who I am, all these dresses. What happens in the journey into contemplative prayer is those dress, dresses get ripped off of us. And hell hath no fury. Like the, <laughs> the extent we'll go to to keep our clothes. <laughs> we don't want to be naked, but as you know, lovemaking only happens when we get naked. And, and it's the same with the Lord. With the Lord, if lovemaking is going to happen, we've got to get naked. And um, that's what we'll fight. That's what we'll resist. Now, most traditional teaching will say that that, that best happens, the not, not only happens, but perhaps best happens in its initial uh, states or experiences in, in the attitude of, of silence and solitude. And that's why the first ones are always running off to the desert. You know, Jesus himself running off to the desert. See, almost like the barrenness of the desert seems to symbolize what they're trying to have happen in their soul. And in that sense, we live in a good part of the world. Plenty of desert around us. Huh? Um, something about silence takes away all those clothes we put on ourselves. There's nobody to impress out there. There's, there's nobody to advertise who we are to. There's not, it's not a consumable product. It's not merchandisable. It doesn't mean anything. Who cares? I know some of you heard me tell the story when I was in Merton's Hermitage. It was 30 days uh, where I couldn't save anybody, where I couldn't preach and be impressive and, and have people need me or like me or something like that. And, and, and you just run around grasping for, who am I, who am I, who am I? And what it comes back to is, I'm not anything, but I seem to be in relationship with somebody. I'm a relationship. Someone's in relationship with me. Someone's here. Uh, someone, in fact, I don't even know if I'm apart from this someone. It seems like this someone is more me than I am I, myself. And then that, that very experience of union, uh, which Ari at first never lived there, never lived in that place. You've always lived in this world of title and role and function and project and, and possibility and, and goal and plan. And when all that's stripped away from you, you're not sure you know how to live in that house. And, and everything in you wants to run away from it. That's why we avoid silence and solitude. Because there's no clothes to put on there. there there's no, no way to assert ourselves. The only way we've known how to assert ourselves. What happens to us almost in spite of ourselves is, is a surrender overtakes us to the very silence. To a new level of being that is experienced as true goodness. Before I've done anything, right or wrong, that I'm, I, I am, and my very being is already all right. And that's when you really shout the hallelujah. It's like you've got nothing to prove. You've got nothing to protect. You don't have to be right in anybody's world anymore. You don't have to win. You don't have to dominate. In fact, you can't dominate anymore because it, it breaks the unity. It destroys the reality that you're experiencing. You can't go back to that world of, of division, standing apart from reality as a subject. Huh? and thinking that it's over there as an object. You can't do that to your brothers and sisters anymore. And that's why, as they always say, contemplation moves toward compassion. Because you know, you know, and it's not knowing up here in the head, it's a total knowing that in all truth, I'm more with you than we're apart. We're more one than we are many. I don't think Christianity has any future, any real possibility without a rediscovery of, of contemplation, it's an experience. And that, that's the absolutely unique thing that we can give it, no one else can. What, what, what true religion, what a true experience of the Spirit calls us to 
is, to put it in another way, is a transformation of consciousness. A transformation of consciousness. The, uh, it, it realigns the ground on which we stand and f- from which we look out at reality. The reason I think the word contemplation, at least now, is, is most accurate and most helpful is that so often when speak, people speak of prayer or meditation, they, they seem to think of it as thinking about Jesus or thinking about God or thinking holy things, but in this present paradigm, huh, I, as a subject, think holy things about Jesus. I think correct dogma about the church. But, but the split still stands. Whereas contemplation breaks the split. Right? I can't live out of that division anymore over against anything because I've been drawn to a center that seems to, in fact, be the center. Now, as you can tell, I'm stumbling for words because it does get very difficult to describe at this point. And for people who've not surrendered themselves to that place but are still defining their isolated selves as right or wrong or good or bad or orthodox or unorthodox, they, they probably don't know what you're talking about when you start talking units of experience is, and that's what we mean when we say it's a gift <laughs> either you've surrendered to it it's been given to you uh, or you don't know what it means now, fortunately and I think this is true more and more research says that you know, very young children are quite open to units of experience again it's like we move out of the garden <laughs> it's like we start in the garden we start in that place of units of experience and then we get in this world of complexity over againstness and in all fairness, we probably have to do that. We have to leave the garden. Uh, we have to live partially out of the false self. I don't know how else a teenager and someone in their 20s, you know, breaks into this world. And that's okay. But there better be someone around telling them, hey, remember, after you do it, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right? And that's the job of, of the church, which I don't think we're doing, saying, Hey, all that role-seeking and all that competition and all that dominance and all that need to be on top and that need to win and be first and be better than other people, it doesn't mean anything. It's illusion. It's, it's, it's self-pretense. It's posturing. It's posing. It's passing. It's all passing away. Don't link on to what's passing away. And we're letting our people do that. With good Catholic schools. I taught in one, you know. A high school are training them to make it in middle class American society and, and as long as they go to church that's right they can live in this split world you know but they're going to church Rahner said it he said by, by the next century um, the only people who will continue in this institutional uh, Christianity are mystics he said to everybody else isn't going to make any sense anymore this isn't going to make any sense and I think in that, in that context, by mystic, he means this. Someone who's moved to that place of union. That place where all things are one. That place that, that cannot be created. It cannot be merited. It cannot be achieved by more sacraments and more rosaries and more uh, reading Bible. It's, it's awakened. It's surrendered to. It is already. You don't earn it by moral actions. By obeying commandments. You don't get your soul. All right? Or you don't, you don't achieve contemplation by 10 years of asceticism and, and 50 years of celibacy, like a lot of us thought. <laughs> that all of this terrible torture is going to win us some kind of unitive experience. In fact, in fact sometimes it, it even makes it less possible, it seems, because, <laughs> because we get, pre- get preoccupied with ourselves as subject. I am doing this. I am, you see, it's the I. It's always the ego, the I, the self. And we haven't found in the West a, a way to let go of that preoccupation with the false I. I think that's why we really don't understand Paul and his whole analogy of the body, John and the vine and the branches, why we really don't understand Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom. Because we're coming at it with this, this Western individualism that, that, that puts everything on the privatized individual, both your guilt and your glory. You know? All your guilt's your fault. I don't think it is. <laughs> You know, we're, we're, we're swept up in evil that is far beyond all of us. And when you get real proud about the thing you did right, how can you even claim that? That's the way your mother loved you, huh? That's the way your husband loved you yesterday. All that love that's been pumped into your life, goodness sort of pops through us once in a while. It rubs off on us. But it's like, it's like we can't even claim, I don't think we can claim either one of them. And what we've got now is these, these separate people 
who've taken the whole burden of, of being good and the guilt of being bad on them. And that's why we have, in my opinion, so many neurotic people and so many unhappy people in religious life, in the clergy, in the church, who are supposed to have the words of salvation. We're supposed to be the, the new creation, the new free people. And I'm not condemning them. I'm just saying that someone told them they could do it while still remaining split, while still remaining divided. They could take that all on themselves. One of the Hasidic masters said, God is not nice. God is not an uncle. God is an earthquake. Great line, huh? God is not nice. You know the word nice isn't in the whole New Testament? <laughs> and yet, and yet, 80% of the sermons I've heard my whole life have been about being nice. Right? It is. It has nothing to do with Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom and what the real is. It's ways to be nice. And Jesus likes nice people. And those of you who are nice are going to go to heaven. And what nice usually means is in whatever culture you go in, being sort of normal, middle class, like everybody else on your block. You know, that's being nice. You know. Be like everybody else on your block and you're nice. You know. God is not nice. <laughs> it's, just, it's so unfair to call God nice. I don't know. That, no, but God, God is not an uncle, as so much religion makes uh, the Lord into this, this one who, who will solve all our problems. That certainly is not the experience of the, the saints or the mystics or the prophets that God is an answer machine, or God always consoles. In fact, where you go to this place that, that Merton calls the palace of nowhere, you're naked, and you want to keep putting those clothes on, you want to keep searching for an identity, but it isn't there. And I want to say early on in, in our whole journey, uh, and this is partially from your wife, uh, Bill Mary, she was giving me a massage one day, in fact, when she said this, I, sure my body inspired her somehow, but she said, <laughs> she said, she said Richard, she says, you know, I don't think, I don't think we're going to uh, change that much at all. She says, what we've got to do, we've got to learn how to live in relationship to the darkness, how to live in relationship to it, really live. And I'm sure this has been told you before, but, but all we can give is what we are. Whatever action you and I are going to be called to, the only thing we will give that will be enduring and real is, in fact, in truth, who you and I are. The wholeness, the truth that, that, that God is able to bring to the situation through our openness. And Rahner says in another place, the, the fundamental religious attitude is openness. It's openness. And, and, and to stand in that openness, not holding on to any character armor, not holding on to any ego identity by which I prove myself right or better than anybody else. It, to, to stand in that kind of openness day by day is the most courageous, wrenching kind of existence possible because we keep uh, wanting to surround ourselves with some kind of protection, some kind of shield. There, I, I think, is, is the, the space that, that we can move forward from. But uh, we're going to have to uh, ask the Lord to lead us on, on that kind of inner journey, on that kind of contemplative journey. Now, I know there's many different temperaments here, many different Myers-Briggs letters and Enneagram numbers, uh, and all of us are going to do it differently, but uh, what we want to call ourselves to from the very beginning is that earthquake, that earthquake experience, that God that, that, uh, that turns this, this reality upside down the way, the way culture defines it for us. It says it's... it's apart, it's complex, it's divided, no, it's one. It says that the top is the best place. And, and the gospel comes along and says, no, the bottom is the best place. Now, it's only people who've surrendered to that earthquake who are going to understand that. Uh, people who haven't are going to want to argue with, it about, uh, with you about it, as if it's a question that can be solved up here. And the only way it can be solved is by a transformation of consciousness, not by a liberal, conservative, right, wrong, it's not an opinion thing that you work out. It's, it's a place uh, that you surrender to, and then there's space inside of that for a, for a number of perspectives, at least a number. I'm not trying to get into some kind of cheap relativism, but simply saying that uh, everything that's true, there's always something about it that's false. Everything that's true. And everything that's false, there's always something about it that's true. And what I'm convinced of is that true spiritual wisdom always has the characteristic of paradox. 
Always, in my, in my experience. Now, maybe my ex- experience is certainly limited. But, but when people present a truth that has no paradoxical character to it, I just don't trust it anymore as being true spiritual wisdom. That's why revelation is revelation. It's, we were told revelation is nothing that human logic or human reason will come to by itself. It can't come to it by itself. We'll work, you know, two plus two equals four, and we'll come up to it. But revelation had to break into the world. It's the earthquake. It breaks in, and, and, and it's something that, that logic of itself, I'm not trying to be anti-intellectual or against reason, but I'm simply saying of itself it doesn't come to that. And, and again, that's the contemplative unitive experience, where you know, and, and other people who know, you can surrender into it together. And you can see the peace that, that characterizes such a group. They can come together, and, uh, and, and you, you know there's been a, a disidentification with ego. There's been a disidentification with the self. I'm not talking about doormat people. I'm not talking about people with a martyr complex who want to suffer or something like that. But just people who, they can give their truth, and they can even fight for their truth, the truth that, that, that they have been given, but they're ready to, to recognize that there's, there's some space around it. Huh? There's some space around it. And that's the space in which community can happen. As Scott Peck so well says in his new book, uh, without emptiness, there's no community. Without emptiness. And we're trying to create communities. We've certainly seen it in this country in the last two decades. uh, Trying to create communities between people who've gone through no self-emptying process. But rather a self-filling process. Getting ideas, getting theologies, getting answers, getting healed, getting whatever. And then they bring all those together and want to create community out of it. And it's like a bunch of balloons bouncing against one another, you know? just doesn't work. You can't hold it together. Because there's an over-identification with opinion, my opinion. There's an over-identification with my feelings. Especially those two. We, those of you who are, or were religious, you know, a word almost all of us were given in our novitiates, which, which we don't hear as much about, is, is the word detachment. And I think it's crucial for the spiritual life. And I think we have to bring that word back into vogue. Because what I see in so many of our good people is an over-attachment to themselves, their opinions, and their feelings. And, and brothers and sisters, you just can't create anything unified or in-depth with that kind of assembly. You can't. It's, it's, it's forever a debating society. And there's always another opinion that has to be heard. Whereas, whereas when there's that self-emptying, when there's that contemplative centering, when you can trust and expect that from the brothers and sisters, that each of us has pulled back from this over-identification with, with the self, you can almost feel sometimes the spirit swoop down upon a circle of people. That truth is going to come out of this. That direction is going to come out of this. Be, because there's a larger unity that is bigger than all of us that God is able to create in that context. That's countercultural. That's radical. That's prophetic. That you're not going to find in very many places at all. That cannot happen without the grace of God, without the experience of surrender, without being in love with the Lord, uh, to use very old-fashioned language, huh? instead of the self. I uh, told a group this week, and, and it uh, strikes me again here, that uh, false religion, in you know, all, all great world religions, seems to come from people saying, Thy kingdom come, Lord, thy kingdom come, but then not saying, My kingdom go. Thinking we can have both kingdoms, both together. And then what you really have is eccentric people, uncentered people, who are living at a center which they think they are instead of the center that is in fact the center, which is the Lord. Uh, is that William McNamara, he calls, um, he calls contemplation a long, loving look at the real. I like that. Simple. It's not real theological, but it's real theological. A <laughs> uh, long, loving look at the real. I took as my first motto when I went into the Hermitage for 30 days a, a quote from the philosopher Wittgenstein who said, don't think, just look. That was very hard for me. I'm not an intellectual, but I do. My mind uh, buzzes all the time. You know? uh, and I, I want to think all the time, make sense out of things, get meaning out of things. It'll make a good sermon or a new set of tapes. See? <laughs> and, and, and what I really had to fast from and detach myself from was the need to do that, the need to make meaning out of things to learn maybe how to begin to live in relationship to the darkness. As, as you and I know, there's a lot of darkness we're dealing with. Now, to live in relationship to the darkness, 
means that you first of all have to have enough discernment to recognize that there is darkness. <laughs> that, there, that It doesn't mean some namby pamby saying, oh, everything is beautiful. Everything is not beautiful. <laughs> There's real darkness in this world. There's real death. God's people are being destroyed and chewed up. And so to, to learn how to live in a relationship to the darkness, you first have to recognize that there is darkness and to have the, the discernment and judgment to say, this is darkness. went on. It was on the Feast of St. Bonaventure this summer. We went up to Cochiti. Maybe some of you were there to see the dances. And uh, the uh, Cochiti, as you know, is famous for the delight makers of the Koshari, the clowns. And uh, sure enough, they were there. And the two lines, as we've all seen here in New Mexico, come out of the kivas, all very uniform, huh? doing uh, the same thing, you know, facing this direction, facing that direction. No one trying to stick out Everyone trying to be a member of the community, just like everybody else. But mixed into this perfect uniformity are these crazy clowns, uh, moving in and out, doing their own thing, uh, sometimes obscenely gesturing and sometimes obscenely dressed. And I was told, I didn't know it till that day, uh, probably many of you know it, that in fact, originally the koshari or the clowns were the keepers of morality. Yeah, yeah, the keepers of morality. And they don't keep morality the way we do. You know, we have our first principles, and we deduce from that what's right and what's wrong. And then we, we make lectures out of them, and we shake the finger at the people. God, that is bad. You're going to go to hell if you do that. You're going to go to heaven if you do this. Uh, it's, it's all out of head principles, a priori, see, from the top. Now, apparently what the Koshari do is mock evil. They laugh at it. Now, it seems to me that's a much better response to evil. Because you never win in a frontal attack on evil. You never win. You sort, of, you sort of misperceive it and you take it on yourself in your righteous indignation very often. But it seems to me they might be on to something, the, the Pueblos, that they laugh at evil, that they mock evil, that they make fun of it. The day we were there, uh, the guy was dancing around with bingo written on his back. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently making fun of what, what some of the Cochiti uh, Indians are, are uh, idolizing as of late. So. Now, these same peoples... I'm told, uh, maybe some of you can tell me if you've heard this too, have in the last few years began to, to uh, practice a yearly exorcism over Los Alamos. Very interesting. That, okay, we with our first principles, with our logic, with our perfect sanity, we, we're sort of, oh, we're not sure it's darkness. You know, we're not sure it's light. There's good people who work there, and we all know good people who work there, but that's not the issue. Hmm? Not the issue. This person can be good, this person can be good, this person can be individually good, but remember, we're talking about un unitive experience, something bigger than this person being good and this privatized morality. There's sometimes a greater evil that individual good people, who are holier than I am, and I mean that sincerely, are caught up in. And that's what we have to learn to develop, those eyes to recognize that level of evil, that darkness, and that's the darkness that is in the greater part destroying the world today. But the Pueblo Indians, it seems to me, have the discernment of spirits, have the wisdom, the, the tribes apparently surrounding Los Alamos, to practice a yearly exorcism over what's happening up there. But we, with our good, even bishops pastoral, thank God for it on War and Peace, but, but as you know, we're still dancing miles away from it, just not sure where we can name it darkness or light. That's what comes, I think, from a lack of contemplative experience. We want to say something that can be proven, that will make sense to the intellectuals of the world, that can't be laughed at in the White House. Hmm? We, want to be, we want to be intelligent dialogue partners with, with the system. And I'm not sure that the prophet or the person of action, as we're going to describe it, has that luxury of, of always making sure that all intellectual, reasonable people will agree with them. Because the, the wisdom they've come from is not from logic, it's from contemplation. It's from seeing what is, and a seeing that is much more uh, uh, broad and profound than simply intellectual seeing. It includes the mind, but it includes the, the emotions. It includes affectivity. It includes the heart. It includes, it includes the body. It's a total seeing. And, and that seeing, I'm afraid, we are not raising up in the church. We're not in the church. We are too. I, I want to say there's just a grand amount of people emerging in the church at that level. But, but sort of uh, in general... In general, it seems that we still think we can solve the problem by law. Instead of, as Paul very clearly told us, by the Spirit. By the Spirit. 
Now, no one wants to move around in that spirit world because it's, it's always sort of vague. The spirit flows well, just like Jesus warned us. Huh? You keep it, all you can do together, surrender perspective, the transformed consciousness, the unity of experience that we're calling contemplation, that place where all things are one. The word diabolical means it comes from the two Greek words diabolain, which means to throw apart, to throw apart reality, to keep it separated, to keep it divided. And and the work of the Spirit, it seems to me, is to unite all things, to link all things, to connect all things. So reality is not over there. But I, in union, am reality. And that's why I can trust myself. No wonder, no wonder so many of our young people, so many of our people hate themselves. I don't think there's going to be any, we can have all the I'm okay, you're okay books you want, right? You can have all the healing seminars you want. Western people are not going to feel good about themselves as long as they live divided, as long as they live separate. Contemplation is the only way through to the truth. It's the only way through to what in fact is happening, what in fact is the objective reality of the world. And that's our gift, as I keep saying. So we, we've got to, whatever we do here, keep calling ourselves to that. Keep creating, creating environments where that can happen. Keep calling one another as brothers and sisters to that truth. To living in a place uh, that we don't have to protect. Living in a place where survival and security are not the first questions as they've become in our society. Thinking that those are absolute rights and absolute needs. Because we know that the self we are it's not a self we've created so far. It's a self we've sort of collapsed into. You know? It's just given. It is. So why do I have to protect the future self? Huh? Why do I have to, to make it survive? It simply is. So it's a knowing that is, is not knowing. They, they spoke of it as the, the cloud of unknowing. It, it's, you know, but it's not a knowing that you can prove. It's not a knowing that you can define or convince anybody else of. But you're, you're content. You're content to know in that way because somehow it's comprehensive. Somehow it's, it's, it's whole. Somehow it's truth. But again, not a truth that you can use as an ego possession. Not a truth that you can use to, to hammer over someone else's head. And as soon as you're doing that with religion, in any aspect of it, you know you're back into the ego. You're back into the, the privatized self. When you're standing apart as better as superior, as right, as, as whatever. There we've lost the transformed consciousness. And we have to plead for the truth again. Lord, take me back to the center. So losing the self, brothers and sisters, uh, and finding God the same thing for me. The false self, of course, we're talking about. The false self. Our primary spiritual enemy is... is this, this identification with something that doesn't exist, that's going to die when we die. And, and when that is allowed to fall away, it seems to me God is obvious and clear and loving. Since God is, is, is it's not a, atheism isn't even an issue for, for the people of Africa. I, I remember the missionaries over there said they never heard of it. You know? That's only a problem for people in the West who live up here who, who think God is an intellectual problem. But a, someone who lives holistically and, and who isn't so attached to themselves, God is obvious, surrounding, upholding, and loving. But, but it's, or as Merton says, mercy within mercy within mercy. And you can just see the contemplative sinking into deeper experiences of mercy, deeper experiences of union. I had a um, quote I wrote down here. I hope I can find it. Now, this is also from Merton. He says, contemplative prayer is a rediscovery of paradise, which he calls unity, within our own spirit by self-forgetfulness. A rediscovery of paradise within our own spirit by self-forgetfulness. Or, or someone else said, I don't know who I'm quoting here, maybe nobody, but it's in my mind. Uh, uh, joy. Joy is the, the fruit of not having of not having. That's why Francis is so joyful. He doesn't have anything anymore. Now, I'm not just talking about material possessions, although that too. That too. And the more you have, the more you've got to protect. But also my reputation. And I want you all to think well of me. Right? 
want you all to think I'm whatever. The more I, uh, energy I put into protecting that, the more trapped I am and the more incapable of joy. I've got to uh, think of myself in any certain way. Maybe the greatest trap in the spiritual life is self-image itself. And we all have it. How do we think about ourselves? Do we need that? Do we really need to think about ourselves? That, that's probably why the fool for Christ could be fooled. Because there was no longer any ego identity they had to protect or had to live up to, even for themselves. They didn't have to. So Francis could go uh, through a CZ in his underwear. Hmm? It's just unthinkable, isn't it? <laughs> Walking through a CZ in his underwear. And as soon as he thought they were, they were thinking he was too holy, that's what he did. It's time to walk through town in our underwear again. You know? Now there is a man who's free from the trap of self-image. And that's why he's called the joyful beggar. I'm the joyful beggar. He's just, I got nothing to prove. I am who I am who I am. And the other times he goes in town with Brother Juniper and spends the day on the seesaw. All day when the people are just admiring him and thinking he's a saint, they spend the whole day on the seesaw. Not saving souls, not working in the soup kitchen with the lepers, just on the seesaw. Too full. <laughs> now there's freedom. Huh? Do we need people like that anymore? Huh? Do we need people like that No. Because we've even got, oh, don't you, I do, our definition of what it means to be holy, which is to work in the soup kitchen, probably, for all of us, you know, or to help the poor, or something like that. But, but if we're even doing that out of this, huh, we're trapped again. I am working in the soup kitchen. I am being holy. I am helping the poor. I am a nice person. I'm whatever. I, 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 I. And uh, there we're trapped. So maybe, uh, maybe we can break with that. And then what we'll do is, is come back and uh, try to talk a little bit about the action part of it. Okay? Good. So there are a few reasons. Roman Vishniak in a book um, called Creativity. He's a uh, microscopic photographer. He says, I was watching a mosquito's head one night under 200 power magnification. And I was astounded by the loveliness of the eyes. Every one of the compound facets was burning in a wonderful color, like gold falling from a setting sun onto the windows of a castle in fairyland. It was so beautiful that I found myself loving this mosquito. But I watched too long. I had no water cell before the lamp, and I didn't realize the strength of the light. Suddenly it was killing him, one by one, the colors of his eyes went out like lights being turned off back of the windows. And through the microscope, I saw the death of this mosquito. And I can tell you, maybe for the first time, it is such a terrible thing, death, even the death of a mosquito. Now maybe that's hard to believe in the middle of the summer. <laughs> but I find it a most extraordinary quote as to vantage point and perspective. And we talked about one critical and central new vantage point, new perspective, a transformed consciousness from the center, from the place where all things are one. But the Gospel has given us a number of other unique vantage points. We talked about the one from the bottom. And I think there's another one, and I also alluded to it uh, earlier. I think it's a bias toward action. And in some ways, it's the hardest for us to surrender to because the gospel has been interpreted so long from the bias toward thinking, toward ideas. And so much of even the life of the church has, interp has been interpreted from that bias, from that perspective. And so I read that quote uh, maybe to simply shock us into the, the power, the possibility, the necessity of a new vantage point. And I think we've tried to create a, a Christianity uh, without discovering those new vantage points, those new perspectives, those radically different perspectives that even might see the death of a mosquito as a tragic thing. I think that since the Sermon on the Mount, the, um, the gospel and Western civilization have been on a collision course. And that collision course has been turned into a one-way street. That one-way street... Uh, its direction has been determined by Western civilization, not by the gospel, not by the church. We've more and more 
accepted the vantage point of the world, the vantage point of Europe, the vantage point of Rome. They became the Pax Romana instead of the Pax Christi. The vantage point of the Greeks, which became this idolization of reason instead of the, 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 the words of Jesus that uh, only the little ones can know. The wise cannot understand. And what's happening most wonderfully now is, is I think by the sheer numbers of God's people on this earth and their suffering, were, were by force of, of suffering and circumstance and situation, were, were coming to almost stumble on to the new vantage points. And then we reopen the gospel and say, my gosh, Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. He told us to look at reality from this perspective. And we see Jesus' uh, three years of ministry itself, or uh, a life on the move, a life that touches a life that, that makes decisions, that moves from here to there, and then explains why he's there. And, 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 and it's like his words make no sense apart from his actions. His words have no power apart from his lifestyle. His preaching has no influence except that it's accompanied by healing and by, by changed lives. But, but that's too integrated for us anymore, and we want to make it just, just think the right thoughts up here. But, but I think what the gospel is undoubtedly calling us to now is a life of action, of course, out of the contemplative center, where we have to pay the price for what we've done with our body, for where we've moved our body, and we have to shake our own head and ask, why am I doing this? <laughs> why, why am I not seeking a, a higher-paying job when everybody else is? Why am I not buying the, 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 uh, the explanation that the government gives us? Why do they not make sense to me anymore? When everybody else says, ah, oh, you know, you got to, business is business. You got to, whatever, the little cliches that, that people put out. Why is it that we can't live with those anymore? I think it's because we stood here, this place where all things are one. I think we cannot underestimate the power of, of this watertight mythology that we're up against. And that words will have little power, I'm convinced, to stand against it. It's only people living in a different way that simply ignores the mythology. Now, that has not been a constant tradition in our Catholic Church. The Mennonites, the Quakers, uh, and the early desert fathers and mothers tend to be much better at that than recent, recent Christianity. We've sort of, more or less, as I said, let the world name the agenda, let the world give the vocabulary, and then Jesus became the icing on the cake instead of the cake itself, which he would have called the reign of God. And I came across recently in Ann Wilson Schaaf's book uh, on, on addiction, what I think is, is a really terrifying but truthful description of the mythology that we're up against. In her first book, Women's Reality, she calls it uh, the white male system. Right? Now, in, in this, this next book, uh, When Society Becomes an Addict, uh, she says, okay, I, I, it, it isn't just white males because a lot of women have bought into the white male system and believe it even more feverishly than a lot of men do. So she calls it now the addictive system. And the, the nature of this addictive system is that it addicts you to itself. It demands total allegiance. And this is the way she describes the, the, uh, the, the allegiance that it demands, the addiction that, that, uh, that has overcome uh, much of Western civilization. And I think it would be fair to say, I guess as a white male I can say it, by and large it's, it's white males running this system for the whole world. It, she says it's supported and sustained by four myths. The first myth is that it is the only thing that exists. There's no other way to think about reality except this way. And, and you know, oh, making the world safe for democracy and... Uh, peace through strength and uh, the power and the truth is at the top and if you really want to make it that's where you climb up to uh, I'm convinced that power and wealth can never want peace and I go back to the gospel and I think that's what he's saying too I don't I don't I, I used to believe and say you know that Jesus came to to free the the oppressed and then when you say that people are ready for you to tell them to go out and serve the poor, and they put all their resistance up. And, uh, oh, Jesus didn't come to free the oppressed. They don't want to believe that. And, and it came to me, well, maybe that isn't really what he came to do, free the oppressed. I think a better way and more truthful way of saying it is he came to free the oppressors. 
He, he, the, 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 the little ones already are free, and that's why he's able to touch them, and power comes out from them. Huh? But it's the ones at the top that, that he cannot speak to, that he cannot relate to, that he cannot talk to, that, 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 are, that are a part of what we're calling here the addictive system. They're convinced that their view of reality is the only way to look at reality. And all intelligent, good-thinking people look at it this way. If you don't, you're just stupid. If you don't, you're just uh, out of it. The second myth is that the white male system, or the addictive system, is innately superior to any other worldview. And all other worldviews have to defend themselves in relationship to this explanation. We know what's best for every country in the world. <laughs> we know what they need. We know the government they need. We know the economic system that they need. And, and if you don't agree with that, of course, you're called bad names because you just you, you don't understand. You're stupid. Because we are innately superior, our, our worldview. The third myth is that the addictive system knows and understands everything. <laughs> knows and understands everything. We know. We have chosen, it's really, uh, we have chosen to name reality. We will name what truth is, and we can make words mean whatever we decide them to mean in the morning paper. Because that's what we need it to mean. It's, it's ultimate arrogance and narcissism. But when it's the only world you've lived in, and it is the world that has all, most of the economic power at its beck and call, it can get away with that level of illusion, with that level of pretense. And so it, it is chosen to name reality and use words day by day what we need them to mean. And if, if, if the in fact reality in Nicaragua doesn't match that, well then it just isn't true. It's just like a, a, a fiat from Washington declaring this is not true because we declare it not to be true. You know? And, and when, when people uh, live as a part of that world for a certain amount of years and all well-meaning, well-intentioned, thinking people agree with it, it really is. Very hard to stand apart from it. The fourth myth is that it is possible to be totally logical, rational, and objective, especially in our system. That we are telling the truth. That we have the objective explanation of things. And anybody who does it, you just don't know. You just don't know. You just don't understand what's needed to keep this world together. We do. Now, in fact, the power and wealth in most countries uh, easily and quickly buy into that worldview. It's not just America, right? It's any culture, any country that has, has chosen to live out of the false self, has chosen to live out of the, the, the self that has to create its own security, its own survival, its own identity, its own importance, its own center. See, that's the ultimate lie when we make this the center instead of the center that is in fact the center, which is God. And so the final character of the four myths is that it is in fact possible to be God. Which is the ultimate blasphemy. Now, to, to use that very word, it just strikes me right now. Do you remember, it was in the last week's paper, when uh, the wife of Casey, uh, the head of the CIA, he was, he was being criticized by this new book, and uh, the wife of Casey called it blasphemy. Now, she's a Catholic. She should know the definition of the word blasphemy. She said to criticize her husband was blasphemy. Do you realize that I just perfectly exemplifies what we're talking about here? There's a nice woman, a nice Irish Catholic woman. <laughs> Forgive me, Megan. <laughs> Who's bought into the white male system just as bad as, as, as her husband had, huh? And called disagreeing with her husband blasphemy. Because this is the only truth. It's the only way to see reality. I heard something really very uh, good to hear from a man from Los Alamos yesterday after saying something critical of Los Alamos. I must say I met one of those good people, a man who apparently is quite high at Los Alamos. And he said he wants to come and talk to me more. He said, you know, uh, most of us, that's the phrase he used, he said most of us up at Los Alamos, he says, we don't really perceive Russia as the primary enemy. I said, you don't. He says, oh, no. He says, the first enemy at this point is this country. Mm. I said, you really think that? I said, I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> he said, the first enemy is this country. He says, simply the incapacity for, for truth, objectivity, uh, reality, depth. It, it's just becoming a very, very shallow culture. 
And I, I said, oh, I just so elated that, and you work at Los Alamos, <laughs> which shows my prejudices, you know. And then he said, and he said, the second biggest enemy we perceive is, get ready, the CIA. He said, these, these are the people working at Los Alamos. He says, he said, the second biggest enemy we perceive is, and he says, we perceive Russia is the third problem. I said, I want to talk to you more. <laughs> Uh, and he says there's simply no, there's no accountability. There's no relationship to any, any reality except their own reality, their own self-protective reality. Both within our country, the mythology of this country, which thinks it is innately superior to all the rest of the world, that the future of civilization is the future of our form of democracy, that, that our economic system it has fell straight from heaven. It's God's plan for the world. It's the same as the kingdom of God. And we can protect it with the fervor with which we protect the kingdom of God. That's how strong the mythology is. And, and if you don't know, you'll find out when you question that. Again, hell hath no fury. And I get people around the country now who come up afterwards. And the anger they, they've got for me now is the anger I used to expect when you would deny transubstantiation or something, you know. <laughs> I mean, not that I ever deny transubstantiation, but are you deny as a papal infallibility or you didn't love the blessed mother you know people might come up and, and get mad at you like that but but now it's uh, I remember a woman these were her very words how dare you question General Motors she said that she said that those are her very words I mean, and it's, it's a religious education conference and you you say where have our people have they ever heard the gospel have they ever heard what the kingdom means have they ever really They've never had the gospel preached to them. It's obvious. They've made an idol of this world. They're bowing down before a massive golden calf and, and don't even know it anymore. I mean, this, this forgotten country has been so put together, you, you just you don't know how we can separate them anymore. And, and you cannot question the American economic system. You cannot question the, the American governmental system. It is the kingdom. And, of course, you all know it's on our dollar bills. huh? Novus ordo seculorum. And, I mean, that's new order of the world, the kingdom. <laughs> and then there's a pyramid there. You've seen the pyramid, huh? And at the top of the pyramid is the eye of God. And so there's just a little space in between the eye. When that eye of God comes, we are the kingdom. We're the new order of the world. Of course, it begins with a great mythology. They were coming across the Atlantic Ocean, and we were the promised land. And this is it. And the white males uh, uh, started naming the reality from the beginning. So, and we're aware of that in New Mexico, huh? But this is where this country started first. And how come most Americans don't know that? Because these were brown males out here. And then as Sir George Marshall, the black Supreme Justice, had the courage to say last month, when everybody was, was shouting the greatness of the Constitution, he said, hey, hey, wait a minute. It was all men are created equal. Yes, men. It never included women at the beginning, and it never included blacks. The only reason the whole thing worked at the beginning is we shipped all kind of black people over here to be our slaves and to hold the whole thing up. So to pretend that this American Constitution was some perfect document that fell from God is just an utter illusion that all men are created equal. I mean, depending on how you want to understand men there. And we never believed that. We, never, we, we believed it was, it was the people at the top who had equality. And the women didn't get it till this century, and in many ways the blacks still don't have it. In at least many people's minds. So, again, I, I want to repeat in talking about action. I don't think this battle, and it is a very real battle, that collision course I'm talking about, can be fought with words anymore. I don't think the issue is liberal, conservative. I don't think it's, it's a, a fighting of opinions. It's not going to be even worked out on the level of reason. Not that that all doesn't have to be done. I'm not against reason, not against, but I believe our primary bias has to be toward action simply living, acting in a new way, as if this is the truth and not that. <laughs> and that's what Jesus came to proclaim. In proclaiming the kingdom, he says, this is the truth. This is the really real. Can you live the kingdom values now? And I believe that's faith. That's why it takes so much faith to have faith. <laughs> because the whole system is saying, no, that isn't reality, that isn't reality, that isn't reality. And we've made faith into believing silly things, you know, Believing things that you can't prove or things that don't make sense. But I think faith is to have the courage to, to live over here and to say, this is reality, that ain't, that isn't, that is not true. But, but unless you've heard the proclamation of the kingdom, unless you've heard the announcement of the really real, 
And by the way, that's the sum and substance of almost all of Jesus' teaching, is the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Now we water that down too, as you know. What do we do? Most, most Christians, and I think I'm being honest in saying most, think that the kingdom is, is, the, is heaven. And we're going to go to the kingdom when we die. That's apparent that Jesus is not saying that. He says, thy kingdom come. He's talking about something coming here. He says, the kingdom is, is, is within you. The kingdom is between you. And, and all of his parables are some truth, some reality coming into this world. So I always say it's when God's truth and this world overlap. When God's truth breaks into this world, into this system. And the price of it is, is very great because the system will, will fight its own protection and its own survival. The other common mistake, this is especially true of our Catholic Church before Vatican II, is we equated the kingdom with the church. And I'm afraid many of our Catholic people would still be there. And, and many of the, the statements of hierarchical figures are still seem to think that allegiance to the church is the be-all and the end-all, is the ultimate question. It isn't. I, that's heresy. That's heresy. I will not say that. If there's nothing in the New Testament that's telling me that, that I have to bow down before the church. The church is a means, and I respect that and love that. It is a mother to us, a great mother church gift that has surrounded us and fed us. But, uh, but to make it the kingdom, to make it the end, it is not the end. It is a means. And whenever the church makes an end of itself, it is creating a golden calf. It is bowing down before its own survival and its own self-protection. Those are the two most common ways we've domesticated Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom. We pushed it into the future and made it heaven, and we made it our own little system of the church and put 85% of our energy into maintaining that, that church system instead of what the church exists for, which is to keep pointing to the kingdom of God, like John the Baptist, pointing beyond itself to the kingdom of God. How do we best point? And I, I, I'd like to think I'm very Franciscan in this, as Francis himself. He really didn't talk that much. He just lived in a new way. If you've been to Assisi in Italy, you see this little walled-in town that isn't much different than when he lived. The walls are still there. But you go outside the walls, and you see San Damiano, the little church he built. And you go down in the plain, and you see the Porziuncola, the other little church he rebuilt. It's very clear what he was doing. It's very clear he was... He was, oh, he was a good Catholic. He loved the Pope and stuck with it all, but he also did it in his own way. That shouted back at the walls of the city, hey, this isn't it. This isn't it. There's another way. He acted. He acted. We joke, uh, between the Jesuits, I don't know that it's always joking, but, uh, between what we call Franciscan discernment and Jesuit discernment. And, uh, we, we describe the Jesuit form of discernment as you work it out. You know, you go to a Jesuit retreat house and pay $50 and you get a private director and you work it out for weeks and you make 30-day retreat and all the rest. And then when you clarify your motivations and where it's coming from, then you decide if you're going to act. Mm-hmm. Well, when you find if you're doing it for the right reason and the time is right and you weigh all your options. And I must admit, as you can see the caricature I'm making, I, I got biased against it living in Cincinnati for so many years where we have a wonderful, magnificent Jesuit retreat house and they do a great deal of good. They really do. I'm not being nice. They do. Good. <laughs> but what I failed to see over the years was a lot of action. After all, it seemed like retreats became an end in themselves. And there were simply retreat house groupies and people who had the money and the time to have private spiritual directors and to, uh, to make 30-day retreats. I mean, I've made them myself. So I mean, but it, all I'm saying is that can't be the whole picture. I'm not saying it's all wrong. But it's, it's a picture that the, the uh, American, the affluent person, the overeducated person is very attracted to. To work it out, work it out. And what I find after a while is they get paralyzed by their options. They're paralyzed by their options. The people I see grow best in the world are zero option people. Well, there's just no options anymore. We were walking uh, with the Jeanette's a few weeks ago along the top of the, the crest from one end to the other and we realized we were at the one end from our car at the other end, but we really didn't have the energy to walk back. And uh, someone brought that up, you know. Now, if we had the option, we, we'd get in our car and go home now. We're dead tired. But we, have no, we have to walk the whole thing again to get back to our car. And we enjoyed the trip back so much more because we stopped living in our head, deciding, do we want to do this? Do we have to do this? Would there be a better way to do it? We have no choice. We must walk back. It's getting cold. <laughs> it's getting dark. We must walk back. Now, that's just a little silly example. But that's when I see people grow. Zero options. And what the, the person who, who lives in their head has is always the creating of another option. 
another way of looking at it, another way of thinking about it. Whereas once you act, you're trapped. And that's what I'd like to call Franciscan discernment. I think Franciscan discernment comes at it from the other side. Francis, I mean, he was a fundamentalist in his own way, but at least he was fundamentalist about the things that mattered. You know what I mean? <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't fundamentalist about how I'm saved and other people are not. You understand? These righteousness trips, these power trips that we have today, people trying to prove themselves right and saved and other people wrong. Francis was always fundamentalist about things that, that demanded a lot of him, that asked him to change, him to be poor, him to surrender, whatever else. And he seems to also have a bias as we see right at the beginning, toward action. He, he hears, go build my church, so he goes out and starts, you know, collecting rocks and starts rebuilding San Damiano. And, and Franciscan discernment is, he, he reads the gospel, here's what it does, he goes out on the road and does it. He goes out on the road and does it. And silly, stupid little things, like getting at a crossroads and just twirling around, and where he lands says, okay, I'm going to do that. And that's, <laughs> that's his zero option. But then he does it again. He does it. He doesn't just stand there, now this would be good, and that would be more moral, and this would be less moral. He lets himself be defined, and he follows after. I'm sure you, you heard in that, uh, that book that was selling so well a few years ago about the best corporations in the country, uh, that the number one reason for the best corporations in the country, I thought I'd put it here, was that they all had a bias toward action. A bias toward action. Uh, let me read it, because I know I put it in here somewhere, and it makes the point so well. You see, I'm not very ordered. Yeah. A bias for, for action, a preference for doing something, anything, rather than sending a question through cycles and cycles of analyses and committee reports. You know. And uh, I guess I can say this, uh, you know, 1,300 miles away from Cincinnati, but uh, as you know, I was a pastor of a community in Cincinnati for, for 15 years, and God bless them. I mean, they've done much good, and they're still doing much good, and there's wonderful people there but they're paralyzed by committees and bureaucracies. I mean, the, committee, the c- community is so well-organized, so intelligent, so aware of all the options that sometimes they can't do anything. All they do is have more meetings to talk about it. Right? And I've seen that happen to many of the best communities in this country, where, where, where the world of liberal, conservative, right, wrong, true, false, judging, consensus building and all the rest uh, becomes an end in itself. I think it's a trap that only affluent people can afford. The leisure to sit around and do all that and send reams and reams and reams of papers and studies and, and so forth instead of, like Francis, simply taking a risk, putting your life on the line and paying the price for it afterwards. I might say there's a dark side to Franciscan discernment. We make a lot of mistakes and pick up the pieces. Pick up the pieces after the fact, but you've got to own them and take responsibility for them. The weakness of the, Fran- the Jesuit discernment is you never get to action. You just keep talking about it and thinking about it and weighing it and working with it. So they both have their gift, you understand? And they both have their dark side. I think we need both of them. I think we do need to, to spend some time looking at where we're coming from and what we're really saying by what we're saying and where our heart is at. And that's the, the, the contemplative life that we want to call ourselves to. But in tandem with that, don't, don't do it very long. Don't stay there too long at all, as if, as if more soul scrubbing is going to attain some kind of inner perfection or another retreat or another set of tapes or, or five more months working it out or three more books. Huh? It's finally you learn in the doing. In mythology, the hero or the heroine could always be described as action. Action itself. Odysseus on his long, adventurous journey. Oedipus. Aeneas wandering through the underworld. Dante's divine comedy. They're always walking walking and experiencing life. Jesus is always walking. He's a peripatetic teacher, moving. And as I keep saying then, asking, what am I doing here? <laughs> feeling your thoughts at that level. Thinking uh, your, your thoughts at that level. Feeling your feelings at that level. It is only, I think, our very recent and psychological age which tries to do away with action and solve all of its problems in the head, in discussion, and on paper. Uh, in fact, someone has said, uh, in, in fairy tales, the hero was, was typically, typically wins the princess or the treasure only through risk, trial, journey, combat, all of which is enacted outside the mind, you know. They're doing things. They're out in boats and, and journeys and climbing mountains. And then they meet the feminine. They meet the princess. 
They meet the interior wisdom, Sophia, at the end. Now, what are modern movies? He's already in bed with her in the first scene of the movie, you know? It's, there's, <laughs> it's, no, it's no meeting of the feminine because there's been no journey. There's no wisdom. There's no self-emptying. There's no surrendering. There's no letting go of anything. And, and how many movies haven't you seen like that? Huh? Well, already, it's the first five minutes. So some kind of false coupling. Some kind of false unity, but there's no unity. So no wonder we have anti-heroes instead of heroes. I think one way to understand it, there's the unwillingness to journey. There's the unwillingness to act. Now, I want to distinguish the action, unless some of you confuse this with activism. I am not saying that whatever we're doing here is going to idealize activism. By that, I, I guess I'm connoting people who are on picket lines, people uh, who are uh, out oh, knocking the system, uh, resisting the system by whatever kind of symbolic action. Now, that might well be called for in a certain sense. In fact, I think it's called for an awful lot today as a new way of living in a new place to stand against it. But I, I still want to say that that's not the essence of it. Activism is not the same as action. The action I'm talking about is, is, is not reaction. It's not rebellion. It's not uh, standing against for the sake of standing against or doing for the sake of doing. It's precisely a, a free, whole response that comes out of the contemplative center where I have to do what I have to do and I'm willing to pay the price for it. But I know I've got to do it. It's not that, that this is the liberal thing to do or this is what the center tells us to do. It's what I know I've got to do. And you can tell the difference in people who are moving from that space, that the action has come from con contemplation or it's merely a liberal trip. That's feeding their own ego. Uh, or, you know, it can become the new kind of uh, relevant sacrament. Uh, that uh, can be another kind of ego possession, or another kind of way of being righteous, another way of being in, another way of being up to date, none of which are the gospel. And so the only action that, that I, I think we want to trust is the, the clear, human, whole action that comes from that centered place in prayer, that is centered in the Lord, as we say. We speak today of two, in the area of social planning, they speak of academic planning, planning in the head, and action planning. Action planning is that moving based on, uh, as Gandhi had, experiments in truth, making experiments, and the assumption that you cannot evaluate or recommend until you have some action that you've lived. And, and so we can't wait forever and make sure that we have perfect motivation. We, 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 we hope we can live centered lives and seek that place of union. Then when the moment comes that, that the heart, the spirit, the mind gather together and, and push us forward, we move forward on that. We might be effective, we might not. That's not the point. And maybe, maybe I can end on just the... Uh, Temptations of Jesus, I'll do this very quickly, in the desert. I think those temptations that Jesus faces in the desert, the three temptations, are the essential temptations that every believer has to face before they can enter into the world of action. Now, I know there are different interpretations of it, but I see them as the need to be effective, the need to be right, and the need to be in control. And again, forgive me for rushing, I'm not going to have time to go into it, but... but uh, in each case, the, the logic, the system, reasonableness offers him an alternative. In the first case, to be effective, to turn stones into bread. Do something that works, that's relevant, that, that'll, that'll, uh, that'll make people admire you or need you or say, yeah, he's good. He refuses to do it. And that, that temptation is profound in all of us to want to be effective. And the purified contemplative spirit is able to act without seeking the fruits of action. I don't think that, that, that conversion is going to come overnight. It hasn't come to me yet. <laughs> I, and I've been in ministry 17 years. Uh, uh, you still, you want to see lives change. You want to see people agree with you. <laughs> you want to see the system change, whatever. I think the second temptation is the need uh, to be well, it's different in the, in the different Gospels, but the need to be, to be right. Where he quotes Scripture, Satan quotes Scripture, and Jesus quotes it, 
posted back to him and says, that's not it. You can use Scripture however you want it to protect your own gain, to protect your own righteousness. And in, instead, he, he surrenders himself. He falls into reality, falls into the truth, but doesn't play games with God that, that angels are going to hold him up and, and realize that you can use spiritual words for your own purposes. He refuses to play the whole game of spiritual righteousness, of spiritual one-upmanship, which so much of religion gets involved in. And finally, the need to be in control. The, Satan offers him all this power, shows him all the kingdoms of the world. You can have them all. If you'll bow down before me, if you'll just you know, play the game my way, kill uh, commies for Christ, and then get rid of them all, and then Christ can take over. See? Where, where we buy the means of the world to achieve the ends of Christ. And we've done that again and again. We bow down before Satan to achieve God's purposes. Use the means of the world to achieve the ends of the Spirit. And until we reunite means and ends, I mean, certainly haven't we seen it as, as recently as in Ali North. And most of our people's morality is no, is no way close to that. In fact, they think you can use whatever means you want as long as you've justified your end. So the need to be effective, the need to be right. God, I need to be right. I want to be right. I'm convinced I'm right. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be right. What I'm saying, the spiritual problem is the need to be right. All right? <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong to be in control, even. The spiritual problem is the need to be in control. But don't think that dies easily. <laughs> and you find it every day, our need to be in control. It's not wrong to be effective now and then. I hope we get a few uh, things that sort of work. But the spiritual problem is the need to be effective. And you lose it. You lose your motivation. Well, I'm not coming back. This isn't going anyway, sitting at the gates of Kirtland each day. No one's changing their mind. That's not the point. That is major surgery. Huh? Major conversion. And the only way you can do it is you're living a life not your own. You're centered in another place other than your own center. And you're, as Mother Teresa says, racking out of obedience, huh? not success. Then those are the actions I can trust. And let me say one final thing. If you at all desire or, or seek to be a prophet, and I think some people should. As we said, the, the underlying image for our, for our work here is a school for prophets. But if you seek to be a prophet, at least two bits of advice are in order. <laughs> Probably a lot more. First of all, make sure, and I know some of you have heard me say this in other places, but it, we need to repeat it here. Make sure that before you appoint the John, you point the John the Baptist finger at America, at church, at anybody else, you recognize that all the evil you don't like, you hate out there is inside you. Because that's the only reason we hate it so much. We've seen it in there, and we, we know it's venomous power. We know it's not of the Lord. We know it's of, of the evil one. Make sure you can recognize it there. And then and only then can you dare to play the prophet. Secondly, and maybe this is an even more difficult grace to ask for, uh, we must ask for the grace to love people even when they do not agree with our prophetic words. Those who fight us and make life hard for us. Only then is this center for action and contemplation going to be a place of reconciliation, of dialogue, out of which we can still speak our truth with conviction, but not out of a place of righteousness, not out of a place of anger, where we become part of the problem instead of a part of the new creation. And my hope is that whatever God might want to do here, that we can go slowly and prayerfully. I'm not concerned about big numbers. I'm not concerned about a big anything. My hope and desire that would be that that five years from now, people will know around this country that people who've come under the influence of this place know what they're talking about. They're smart from the heart. They, uh, they're integrated. They're real. They're, uh, they're people that, that they can trust spiritually and, and in terms of what they're saying about the society. That it's not just some recent opinion or some liberal fad. But they've done their social analysis. They've read their scriptures. And they've, they've believed in, in the Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God. And, and to speak well of, of New Jerusalem, too, uh, for, our, for our dark side, I have to say, I think many of our people had that exact reputation in Cincinnati. 
that, uh, that when our people would speak in many of the issues, or too many of the issues, when, when uh, people heard they were from the community, they trusted them. They had credibility. That they knew they weren't just shooting off the top of their mouth. They were people of prayer, people who lived in community, had been tested and tried, and, and what they were doing uh, could, could be listened to. And we want to have that kind of credibility, not for ourselves, but for the sake of the gospel that we hope we're, we're teaching, for the sake of the truth that we hope we can proclaim. So, that's the beginning, and we'll build on that in the following weeks. Thank you.